Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's 3.30 and I want to, want to honor your time. Thank you so much for joining in today. Um, this is the current episode of Webinar Wednesday. We're going to be um, learning about flipped classroom video creation. Uh, and this is Webinar Wednesday for March 13th, 2019. And you can see at the bottom left side of the slide where you can access the resources for today. You can also um, look in the chat box. So I'm, I'm hoping that if you're joined, if you've joined in on the web, you can see the chat box and you'll be able to access the slides for today. If not, so you can uh, send me a message, send me an email, and I'll be happy to um, allow you access to the slide deck for today. I'm Carla Kuyper, EBR Director of Technology Integration, and I'm also a Flipped Learning Global Certified Educator and a Flipped Learning Global Certified Trainer. If you have any questions about anything in today's webinar, or if you'd like to continue the conversation about some of the things that I share today, uh, feel free to contact me using email. Uh, drop by the Professional Development Center on North Sherwoods, where, uh, where I am, or you can call our office at 226-4812, or um, let's keep the conversation going on, uh, on Twitter as well. If at any point you lose your audio and you need to pick up the audio using your phone, I've included the... Um, and dial in numbers and I'll even put those in the chat box so that just in case we have any audio issues you can also dial in. And they're in the slide deck as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we have that information available. This webinar is one webinar in a series of free technology integration webinars. I do, I'm doing these every other Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. I try to keep the informational portion of it short and leave time for question and answer. And um, you can register in advance on Go Sign Me Up. I try to send out reminders to you, send out hyperlinks to you prior to the webinar. So if you register in advance, you get a few bonuses. But um, if you go on Go Sign Me Up, you can also find the direct join links as well. And you can see so that we are, I'm in uh, episode four of this spring's webinar series. And the next episode will be about Google Data Studio. So if you're interested in data dashboards, um, and getting started, then check um, check out Webinar Wednesday on March the 27th, and we'll be talking about Google Data Studio. Today's agenda is designed to cover the following topics. We'll talk about flipped learning, kind of why flipped learning got started, tips for effective videos, creating videos, a little bit about augmented reality and virtual reality, AR and VR, creating text interactions, and then also how to handle some low tech scenarios or some scenarios maybe when your technology isn't working. You do have it, but it's just not working. We'll talk about additional resources and then questions and answers. Now, why flip? Let's start with the why. And let's talk about kind of the definition of flip learning, what flip learning is and also what it isn't. It's an approach to pedagogy in which direct instruction moves from a group learning space, so from the whole group instructional space, and it moves to an individual space. And the magic of that is technology. We have so much technology available to us today that we can easily record lectures or we can record demonstrations and we can record um, students uh, engaging in so many different activities and, and so many presentations that we can move um, direct instructional materials into a digital space. Uh, the group space then, our group time, whole group time becomes transformed into a time for things like small groups, um, project-based learning, hands-on science inquiry, student-led research, writer's workshops, Socratic circles, and a whole lot more. 
So if students are accessing direct instruction uh, in a digital space in Google Classroom, and they can do this at almost any time, then it can become beneficial for those times when uh, you'd like to lead students in project-based learning or when you want student-led research or student-led projects to take the front row in the class as opposed to whole group lecturing. Um, flipped instruction is not students teaching themselves a video. It's not using video instead of having a live teacher. It's um, not assigning Discovery Ed or YouTube for homework. And um, again, you'll notice that there's a hyperlink there that will take you to the definition of flipped learning. Um, flipped learning videos can be viewed by students as part of a class. They can be viewed by students outside of class. So just keep that in mind as you um, think about how you might incorporate flipped learning into your pedagogy. All right, I have a question coming in about the DEC resources, and I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat box again. So let me get out of presentation mode for a second and flip back to make sure that we all can get that link. All right, I hope that you got that. And let me get back into presentation mode and flip through some slides. Okay, so when, when do um, teachers tend to adopt flipped learning? Well, to tell a little bit of backstory, flipped learning came about um, in the uh, mid part of the 2000s, um, many times teachers will use flipped learning at the start of a unit of instruction. Uh, the teachers who started using flipped learning and began to adopt it wanted to pre or front load material for their students. They were spending a lot of time uh, teaching and reteaching level one and level two depth of knowledge material and wanted to find a way to create more time in their classes for things like inquiry, project-based learning, and student-led activities. The two gentlemen who've become best affiliated with flipped learning, Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams, actually created um, the lectures of themselves or created videos of themselves lecturing. They're two chemistry teachers, and they were struggling with students who weren't coming to class or who would miss school. So they would have um, their lectures on video, um, and allow students to view the lectures and take notes from the lectures whenever they could. So they had struggling students. They were working with students that had some severe attendance issues. And so that's when they got the idea of videoing themselves, uh, teaching their classes. Now, they started sharing the videos with the kids who missed class, and then they started sharing the videos with the students who were struggling and who needed to hear the lecture again or who needed the class um, materials again. And they found that it was such a game changer that they got the idea that they would even have students watch the videos prior to coming to class because they found that students who viewed a video outside of class oftentimes got more out of the class. So in an ideal world, of course, you would find and curate the perfect video content online. Um, every school might have a digital media program or um, every uh, school would have or a, a production center for digital media. We'd have one for the district. But in most cases, teachers start trying to create flipped content and then they find that there are technical issues. And, and other problems and severe time constraints because filming, uh, preparing to film, editing video, uploading video, um, sharing video in Google Drive on Google Classroom, all of it takes a certain amount of time. So today's webinar is designed to talk about some of the challenges of video creation and maybe give you some ideas of how you might start video creating in your classroom, but in the easiest and in the least painful way. So before we talk about specifics on creating videos, let's talk about just a few guidelines. Um, you need to think about creating videos in terms of preparing first, um, recording, 
how you might go about recording. So you have to put some thought into what you'll record with and how you'll record. Think about editing. Will you edit the videos? If you create lectures, um, if you create lecture videos or you create videos of yourself teaching content to students, will you edit those videos or not? How are you going to share the videos and how will you deliver them to the students? Will you upload them into Google Drive and share links in Google Classroom? Will you post them on a website so that parents can access them? You have to just put a little bit of thought into that um, prior to uh, making the videos available. Then you'll have to think about policies. Um, will you require students to watch the videos? Sometimes teachers give students a grade for completing videos. Sometimes um, teachers mainly create them as a resource for students so that they always have those um, available to them. And then, of course, the issue of whether or not students can watch videos inside or outside of class. As we know, there is a digital gap um, in our society. There are many students who do not have access continuous regular access to high speed internet and so this can create some real achievement gaps in your class if some students have access to content outside of class for review and other students don't. So there's a handout of helpful guidelines attached to the slide and it'll take you through several of the considerations and things to think about as you create videos. Um, or as you begin to think about creating videos. So think about whether or not you want to create a script, um, how to create a creative presentation, or if you're just going to focus on your content. Um, equipment, how to make sure that you have enough uh, power, sound, how to prepare uh, software in case you use any software, um, checking how to check the light and the sound in a classroom environment to see if you have a good setup for video, and then a lot of other guidelines as well, how to be personal, um, the guidelines for the length of video as well. Just a few tips for effective videos. The most effective flipped instructional videos are short. The recommended guideline is about a minute to a minute and a half per grade level. If you can keep videos under eight to 10 minutes tops, that's con generally considered good. So for a fourth grader, the video would not really go more than six minutes. Um, it's just, in general, a lot better if you can simplify uh, your content to bring it into a digital space. Another technique is to animate your voice to keep students interested, especially younger students. They tend to enjoy videos more when they hear their teachers talking and you're varying your tone of voice or you, you sound like you're in a conversation with them, like you're talking only to them. They really enjoy that. Work with other teachers if you can. If you can create a teacher-student conversation, even if it's two teachers, if it's yourself and another teacher, and you're having kind of a teacher-student conversation about the content, on the video, students really seem to benefit from those kinds of videos and they enjoy them too. Audio does matter. Find a quiet space if you can. If your classroom is not a quiet space based on your location in the school, then you may want to find um, a microphone or an audio setup that can, that can cancel noise. And so you'll see on the screen, I've got a couple of, of suggestions um, that I've used. One is called the Samson Meteor Mic, and it does have noise canceling on it. And then the other one is uh, I use a Blue Yeti. In fact, I'm using a Blue Yeti right now to do uh, this webinar. So invest in a good microphone. If your space is noisy, invest in one of the mics that can cancel out some of the extraneous sounds. If you use someone else's video, if you decide that initially that using or creating your own videos is too overwhelming and you want to use someone else's videos um, for flipped content, just preview it, make sure the content aligns, make sure the instructor is using the same vocabulary that you would use and use it the same way that you would so that you don't confuse your students. Um, in general, less text and more pictures is great for students. If you do decide to use someone else's video or video clips, model good digital citizenship and, um, and use copywriting uh, and, and let students know that you didn't create this and you're giving someone else the credit.
It helps if you can use a tool that will allow you to draw on the screen. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Put yourself in the picture. So turn on your webcam if your uh, Wi-Fi environment allows it. Uh, add interaction. Edpuzzle. We'll talk about Edpuzzle a little bit later on in the webinar. And if, I think we mentioned just earlier, if you can script or storyboard a little bit in advance, then that also helps. Okay, so let's dive in and talk a little bit about creating videos. So screencasting. Screencasting is an excellent way to begin to create some flipped videos and it works really well because you can capture all of the action on your computer while you talk the students through and so when you when you're talking the students through you can be thinking aloud you can be um, giving them things to notice uh, all of those things can help students uh, gather a better understanding of concepts whenever you've got a well-designed sequence of things that you want students to do, to learn, to remember, consider screencasting. It'll save time and that you don't find yourself having to reteach those lessons as often. Now, I've got a few, a couple of suggestions here. These are by no means the only ones. The first one that I have is called Screencast-O-Matic. And I've also got a suggestion here. The second one is Screencastify, and it's a Chrome extension. So I'm going to jump out sec uh, for a second and go to Screencast-O-Matic. So it's a website. It's free. And it's a screen recorder. You can create an account, and there's even a premium version that will let you do some editing. But this is just a basic free screen recorder. It lets you capture your computer screen and it allows you to add narration to anything um, from your from your webcam on your on your laptop. It's also available on the Chromebook. So when I go to launch free recorder, um, it's going to ask me to open the screen recorder. And I can just come over here to my screen recorder and here it comes. It takes just a few moments to get going. And so now here's the screen recorder on my screen. The recorder is going to record anything that happens within the frame. So anything that I'm showing to the students, any document that I pull up on the screen, any uh, text that I pull up on the screen, anything that I want to show the students, I can do with Screencast-O-Matic. So consider screencasting using a tool like Screencast-O-Matic. And on the slide uh, about screencasting on the computer, I've also got a video that's all about how to screencast with your computer. And on the video that I have, this one is all about how to use Screencastify. I like Screencastify, and I want to recommend it to you because what Screencastify will do is it will make it easier in that it loads the video directly into Google Drive okay, for in you. This video, I'm going to show you how to create a flipped video using a Chrome extension called Screencastify. Now, there are different ways to create screencasts, and screencasts are really, really useful if your teaching style or your lessons incorporate um, demonstrating how to do things or how to work with text on a, you know, on a computer in a digital format. Um, Screencastify can be very useful to you. You can see I've got an instructional task pulled up from LDOE. This is a social studies task for seventh grade um, social studies. And you can see that in this task, the students have to analyze multiple sources and use their knowledge of United States history to write an essay. So this could be really useful to students, especially students who join your class in the middle of the year or who join your class after you've taught the class how to analyze multiple sources. So one of the things that students need to do in this task is to um, 
read through. So I'm not going to go through the, the whole video. I'll let you take some time and go through the whole video. But in the video, I'm showing you how to use Screencastify. I would definitely, by all means, take instructional tasks um, that I need students to learn how to do. Again, whenever you've got a well-designed sequence of things that you want students to think about and then do, you can use screencasting. I would take, um, again, instructional tasks, anything uh, text uh, protocols that you have for students that you're teaching students how to close read, um, how to analyze text. Um, anytime you are modeling that for students and thinking aloud and showing them how to decode challenging vocabulary, these types of videos have a great um, beneficial impact on students. So the videos there about Screencastify, how to get Screencastify, there's a, a link that'll take you there. I've also included a link to a page, a website for um, an ed tech guru by the name of Kathy Schrock. She's got a really wonderful website all about screencasting. Well, her website is just awesome overall. And one of her pages that really intrigues me is all about screencasting and screen recording. And she's got a number of different articles, rubrics, and a lot more. Information about teachers creating screencasts, students creating screencasts. And again, she's got a number of different tools here for you to try as well. Now, if you find the idea of creating a screencast kind of, of a daunting task, or you could be thinking, well, I don't do all of my uh, teaching on the computer. What if I do a lot of teaching on the whiteboard? You may want to consider creating flip videos with your smartphone. The way to do that is that you'll need to add your smartphone to a tripod. And you'll need to uh, have a smartphone phone tripod adapter attached uh, to the tripod so that it'll hold your, your smartphone. The advantage of this type of a setup is that it's really easy. It's very super mobile. It can go anywhere at a moment's notice. And the other thing is that it takes advantage of the really good cameras that are in smartphones. Um, and so I've got a video that talks about how to get going. Hang on, let me jump back a little bit. My smartphone. I have an iPhone. You might have an Android. That will work just well as well. Um, I also have something to hold my smartphone steady while I use it um, to record. So you need this. You, um, if you look on the slide, you'll see I have some hyperlinks to buy. A, um, uh, I guess this is a holder or clamp for a smartphone. And then the third piece of equipment that I'm going to use is a mini tripod. And on the slide, you'll see a hyperlink that'll take you to where you can learn more about these mini tripods. So you need something to hold the entire thing steady while you're recording. Okay, so here I am. I have placed my smartphone in the holder and I've attached my holder to the mini tripod and I've set my Whole entire setup at a height so that it can shoot me in front of this whiteboard um, as I talk students through the process or the steps to solve a math problem. And you could insert your content area in there um, if you use the whiteboard a lot. So if you use the whiteboard to explain your thinking to students and you expect students to explain their thinking using the whiteboard, um, you can go with a low production setup using a smartphone and a cheap tripod setup. Um, in this setup, you can see I'm using the rear facing camera once again so that you understand kind of how this works. Okay, so I encourage it. So um, the, the main benefit of creating your own content this way is so that you can use your teaching style, your teaching methods, your curriculum. Um, it may prove to be a big advantage over um, using videos uh, in that you curate from a website. So just make sure that you find good lighting. Most of the time, um, the, if you're using a smartphone, the camera is going to do great. The microphones on smartphones are awesome these days. Uh, the biggest uh, trick is to find good lighting 
for your for your video and then uh, get the tripod adapter and um, also get the uh, the small camera tripod and as you can see i put some hyperlinks on this slide i built my little tripod set up for 25 dollars now if you have an ipad or an android tablet you might be thinking maybe i could take that tablet that I have and make that work for me to allow me to create some flipped content. And if you're thinking along those lines, you may have a few things that you can explore on this slide. I use an app called Doceri. And Doceri is one of those apps that, that you install it on your iPad and then you install it on the computer and they kind of talk, they kind of let the two things talk to each other. If you don't want to go down that road, you can use an app like Show Me or Educreations. And so I have an app installed on my iPad. This is the app. It's called Educreations. It's also a website. And here's the website. You can do this completely on your computer. You can use the Education site on your computer if that's what you'd like to do. Um, on the slide, you'll notice that I've got a video of creating a flipped video with, with an iPad. And I won't show the whole thing, but I'll just let you get an idea of it. Let me jump back. Okay, so to do this demo on using a tablet to create flipped videos, I'm going to start by um, turning on the screen record feature on my iPad. Now, I've got an iPad Pro, and so I swipe down from the top right to get my um, screen recording feature to come on. You can do this with any um, iPad as long as you have the newest operating system. And um, you may need to swipe up from the bottom on your iPad if you're not using an iPad Pro. So once you um, open the Educreations app on the iPad, then you're gonna see it opens up a white space that allows you to write and draw and talk and even add images. And at this point, I can grab the pen, I can write, I have a nice whiteboard in front of me. Anything that I would write uh, on the uh, whiteboard with a marker, I could use um, Educreations to do basically the same thing. So the way this works is that once I've finished creating, um, the content on my whiteboard. I just hit the share button on my uh, tablet and it shares it to the Educreations website. And I like the Educreations site because you can log in with Google. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. And so once I hit the share button on my tablet, it goes to the website. And so now I've got a video on uh, the Educreations website that I can go ahead and uh, get the hyperlink off this video and, uh, and share it uh, to my students in Google Classroom or um, on the web. And I even can, uh, can set up a class and uh, check out who's watching and how much time they spend watching and when they watch uh, the video. So pretty cool. It's called Educreations. Now, if you really, as soon as you're ready to take it to the next level, you really want to take it up a notch, is to use Edpuzzle. Now, Edpuzzle is a really popular program in EBR and it's easy to understand why you will understand why um, if you are not familiar with it what Edpuzzle does is that it allows teachers to add formative assessment questions to videos um, you can upload your own videos to uh, Edpuzzle or you can use videos from YouTube from uh, TED Ed and a few other websites as well it really allows you to put that accountability and comprehension piece into classroom video. It 
integrates seamlessly with Google Classroom, and there's even PD that goes along with it. So here's Edpuzzle. And I'm going to go ahead and log in with Google. And once I'm in, I can uh, go in and create content um, from channels like at, uh, YouTube, Khan Academy, Nat Geo. There's a bunch of different um, content channels that you can pick from. I can even go in and search. Uh, let me find Steve Jobs' commencement address. And here it is. So it's on YouTube. This is a video that I know is on YouTube, but you can search around a bit. And so once I, ha I see a video or I find a video, I can uh, take that video and I can edit the video or I can watch it. I can make a copy of it and it copies it to my content. And then once I get that video in my own content, I can take that video and start adding things to it like questions. Uh, I can hit the quiz button here and add a question to it. And so to go forward in the video or to complete the entire video, the students have to answer these questions. And you'll find that there are tons of videos that are already created. And there's also some that you can create yourself. Call in the middle of the night asking We've got an unexpected baby boy. Do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. Okay, so to continue on in the video, the student has to stop and answer the question. Okay, so the, when the student sees this, they'll have to answer a question. Who, was the, who is the intended audience that the speaker wants to influence? And they'll have to stop, and if they need to rewind, they can go ahead and do that, but they can't move forward without um, answering the question. You get a great book inside of Edpuzzle that lets you see who watched the video, how much of the video they actually completed, and um, how they did in terms of, of answering the video. It's really easy. Uh, Edpuzzle can pull in your Google Classroom classes, and you can share those videos out and assign uh, in Google Classroom from Edpuzzle. So it, or you can create hyperlinks if you prefer. And you can even prevent students from skipping through the video. So Edpuzzle is a wonderful resource. It's the basics are free, and um, and you can create and upload or find curated content and hold students accountable for watching and keep them engaged while watching by adding those formative assessment questions. Now, we've talked about screencasting with your computer. We've talked about filming yourself with your um, tablet or with a smartphone. And so now let's look at some of the other ways that you can create content for a flipped lesson. And some of these you might have readily have the materials available to you, whereas some of these might be uh, just suggestions. So augmented reality is another way, it's another tool that's becoming more and more prevalent and you can pull the, this type of content into your lessons. Um, you can create flipped lessons using Merge Cubes and there are Merge Cubes at Walmart and at Target. You can also buy them online. There's a website that you can go to. Um, there are a couple of apps that I'm just gonna show you. You can go to the entire list of Merge Cube apps for the um, iPhone on, um, on the iTunes uh, site. And this is a technology really to keep, we should keep our eyes on as instructors and as educators because it's only going to grow more and more. So let me show you what, 
how this works. All right, so here's my, um, hopefully you can see the screen on my uh, phone. And I'm going to go to the anatomy app. Takes a few minutes. I've got a merge cube here. It's going to ask for access to my camera. I'm going to go into phone mode. And then so with the merge cube, I can uh, set up the experience for students to explore. So let me move it away so you can see the merge cube and then see it come back. So I've got the human brain and my students can tap and start examining and exploring the structures of the brain. It keeps going. And then other body parts. Um, so the students can, again, they can begin to, they can go deeper, they can explore. Students can do these kinds of things while you will have, a, maybe have another group of students doing project-based learning or engaging in inquiry learning. And so, again, this, is, this technology is still emerging, but how cool is that? I mean, it's amazing and it's incredible. If augmented reality and merge cubes are not exactly what um, you might want to do, bring into your class, you might be able to bring virtual reality into your class. Right now, virtual reality does take some setup and some preparation, and um, it can go from very low end to very high end, depending on what type of equipment you use. Um, I've got a couple of suggestions. If you can do high end, you could create flipped lesson materials or flipped lesson videos using a uh, virtual reality with Google Expeditions. These can be used with or without headsets. And there are over 900 different expeditions that you can take the students on. So it, using a headset, they can see um, inside of different locations different times, different places, places that uh, we would never be able to, to travel to um, in a normal uh, school year. So you can also set this up very low end, uh, just with, with uh, handheld devices. So if your students have smartphones, you could have them download the Google Expeditions app and just have them download the experience and explore again, without headsets. So again, while students are exploring and taking notes and building background, you can have another group of students uh, completing an instructional task or that you're working with reteaching. So again, incredible technology that uh, we will probably have to keep our eyes on to um, learn more about as, as, as time goes on. Another option for virtual reality, if Google Expedition sounds too difficult and too expensive for your school or your classroom, look for virtual reality videos on YouTube. They're out there. Just pull up YouTube, um, look for virtual reality, and you'll find that there are tons of videos that are filmed in 360 degrees, 360 degree videos. And you'll notice that like, these videos are not only in 360, but they have these little hot spots that give students something to look at and to do and, um, in, embedded in the video itself. In addition to that, there's a website called ThingLink that allows you to upload images and videos 
and allows you to add hotspots and then to share the links with others. So I took, I took the link to a 360 video and I just added a couple of hotspots to create an interactive experience, an immersive experience that would give students something to do. A great question coming in, it was how often are new tours added to Google Expeditions? It seems like they add them all the time, all the time. So here's Thing Link. Again, this is a 360 immersive video. I'm sorry, my video might be a little slow. Well, when you look at the glacier like that, vantage point of a helicopter, it looks like it's going to be here forever. All right, so here's a hot spot that I added in. How could it possibly go away? It's going to allow students to look at a photo and then go to a website where they can learn more. So you can go uh, have them go to a Google map, a website, a slide deck, a writing activity. And so you can create these immersive experiences that um, not only give students things to explore and to engage in inquiry, but also that help them to build background. You can also create text interactions. So everything does not have to be about a video. Um, there may be times when you want students to interact with text. There are times when we want them to focus on text and not visuals, and we want them to learn about text. And so Actively Learn is a website that I think is pretty awesome. And it has some tools built into it that allow you to add higher, higher order thinking questions to online text. All right, and I'm going to log in with Google. And there are a lot of articles that are here. They're, these are interactive texts. So we can click on a text and check out the interactivity. So there's a essential question, then a poll, and then here's the article. And all interspersed throughout this article are um, higher order thinking questions that cause me to have to stop, read, go back, reread for information and for evidence, and then answer the questions. The whole time, uh, you can set up your class in here, and then you can be gathering information about um, student comprehension. You can also upload your own content to this website, so you don't have to only use the content that you see here. You get, um, you get three free uploads per month on a free account for Actively Learn. So there's a lot, there are many, many wonderful ways. There are also uh, FET simulations here. And so many times teachers in the flipped classroom environment will uh, use a tool, use this tool to allow students to interact with text in, a, in an immersive way, while they're also holding them accountable for reading. So it's called Actively Learn, activelylearn.com, and you can create flipped lessons focused on text where it's not so much about the student watching a video. Next, I'm gonna talk about um, low tech scenarios. Situations, what can you do if you find yourself in a situation, Wi-Fi is not working so well, um, or you're in a situation where um, you have equipment and it stops working. So one thing you can do is you can use a document camera. So many, many teachers have access to a document camera. Or they can check out a document camera from the library. If you can connect your document camera to your projector, you can usually also connect it to your computer. So you can record yourself as you write, draw, annotate, 
think aloud, and also explain. You just have to find the software that goes with the type of doc cam that you have. And so I created a little demo. And in the demo, you're going to see that I'm working with a ladybug, um, some of the late, one of the ladybug cameras that we have here at the PDC. But you may have something different, and you'll have to find out the type of the document camera that you have. So you can um, create flipped videos that way. And I just want to skip to the part where I turn on the dot cam and just show you how you can record on your computer. can see the um, assignment that I have here. So if you spend a lot of time, let's focus. So if you spend a lot of time using a document camera, then um, this can be a way to go. So, so in, in this demo, um, and I'll allow you to some time to watch it, I'll let you watch it on your own. Um, you can create flip videos with a document camera. If you're using uh, paper materials or if you want to use a whiteboard and you want to demo for students, um, you can go ahead and connect it. I would connect it to a physical computer if you're, if you're having Wi-Fi issues. Go ahead and connect your document camera to your desktop and download the software and then use the uh, software on your computer to, to video or to create a video of yourself teaching a lesson. You can also add video to Google Forms and share those in Google Classroom. So it's, it's pretty straightforward to add um, video to Forms. When you're in a form, you can, um, let me get into edit mode. When you're adding your questions, we'll let everything load completely. When you go to add your questions, just make sure that you go here to this section where you're going to uh, add a video. So hit that video icon and you'll get the option to add video. Now the downside of adding the video to the Google form is that it gets a little bit more difficult to hold them accountable, but you can search for videos on YouTube and then add them to your, to your form. Again, if you're, in, if you're in a low tech setup or if you're in a setup where you're not sure if filming yourself is going to work, this is an option. Um, I'm going to just share a couple of additional ways to learn it and I'll stop and we can chat and um, see if we have any questions. Um, one thing you can do is become Flip Learning certified. There's a Flip Learning certification. There is a cost associated with it. So it's something you can decide if you, if you want to do or you can talk with your principal about it and see if there's some funding uh, in, your, in your school's budget for it. Um, so there's Flip Learning certification, level one, level two, trainer, and so on. And it's just a wonderful community to go to become a part of. Once you become certified, you become a part of this global community of educators, um, all trying to help each other. The other thing that I would recommend is um, the book, Flip Your Classroom, Reach Every Student in Every Class Every Day, written by Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams, those two chemistry teacher guys who really became prominent flipping their classes because they had the they had low achievement and attendance problems and uh, also students with behavioral problems in their class and they found that flipping their um, instruction was a game changer. So at this point I'm going to stop and just find out if you have any questions or any thoughts about all of this. Um, feel free to um, unmute and to go ahead and Share anything that you're thinking or any questions that you'd like to ask.
Okay, um, question coming in. Hello. This, no, oh, uh, yeah, this is Miss Hall. Oh, hi, Miss Hall. How are you doing? Um, yes. Hi, I have a question. Um, and I'm just thinking about best practices. Mm -hmm. Um, is it okay to um create a flipped environment for homework purposes? I just came in at four o'clock, and you may have okay. discussed that, but no, is um, it okay? So you, so in other words, that I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier on in the, in the okay. video. You do have to take some time and think about policy. So, Ms. Hall, I know you okay. are in an elementary setting, and so yeah. parents uh, will be very concerned about their students with homework. And so, um, you know, most of the time, parents are right there alongside um, elementary yeah. students with that homework. And so, you have to set. You would have to set forth a very clear policy about um, whether or not it would be required or if it would be something that uh, if if there's a if there's an internet problem at home would they be allowed to make it up oh, um, it's yeah. something that you'd have to you'd have to consider very carefully would you allow any time within class um, for students who, who are not able to access something at home because um, in every school there are students who do genuinely have difficulty accessing video mm -hmm. or you might want to consider what are some of the alternatives to YouTube is there a way that you could give a student a DVD could you um, mm -hmm. could you check yeah. out an iPod to them with the video loaded okay. on it so you'd have to yeah. consider all of that pretty pretty carefully um, in terms of, or you'd have to find out if the parents have a smartphone that they would be willing to, to let the student use um, okay. before you set a hard line policy about grading uh, video homework. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, it was a great question and it does come up in, in a flipped environment. So um, sometimes teachers set can set that policy around requiring students to do ed puzzle for homework or um, requiring students to access a tool like actively learn for homework in google classroom yeah. and then sometimes uh, you have to make a flexible policy okay all right thank uh, you another question was um, any opportunities to learn more about augmented reality i i think that yes there's we definitely need to have some more um workshops maybe about augmented reality. There's um, some AR in Google Expeditions, and then these merge cubes are out here, and there's just, I think there really is, a um, there's a lot to keep our eye on with this. And so, yes, I think um, we do need to include a AR um, and VR. We, we have a set of, um, of expeditions here at the PDC. We do check them out. So um, complete our uh, tech integration support request and um, ask about virtual reality and then we'll get with you and we'll allow you to, uh, to check out the Google expeditions and so that you can bring them into your school and learn more about AR and VR. Another great question. All right. Well, that, that's all that I have for today. Thank you so much for joining in um, and coming into this virtual professional development and sharing this time with me. If you have any additional questions, I'm going to hang around for a little while um, online so that you and I can, can chat. Or again, um, feel free to reach out after the webinar. Call us at the PDC. Stop by. Um, follow us on Twitter. Um, check out our website, and if you think of something later on, be sure to uh, send me an email or even uh, let's keep the conversation going on Twitter.